Welcome to the Insomnia Coach Podcast. My name is Martin Reed. I believe that by changing how we respond to insomnia and all the difficult thoughts and feelings that come with it, we can move away from struggling with insomnia and toward living the life we want to live. The content of this podcast is provided for informational and educational purposes only. It's not medical advice and is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease, disorder, or medical condition. It should never replace any advice given to you by your physician or any other licensed healthcare provider. Insomnia Coach LLC offers coaching services only and does not provide therapy, counseling, medical advice, or medical treatment. The statements and opinions expressed by guests are their own and are not necessarily endorsed by Insomnia Coach LLC. All content is provided as is and without warranties, either express or implied. A couple of years ago, Maria experienced anxiety and panic attacks. When she didn't sleep for over 72 hours, she felt that something was wrong with her. She feared that the chemistry of her brain had changed and her days became dominated by sleep-related thoughts and worries. Medication didn't seem to help. Maria felt lonely, confused and afraid. She felt that she couldn't even leave the house because things were so difficult. She withdrew from doing things that she enjoyed. She found it hard to focus on anything other than sleep. Feeling completely stuck, Maria committed to a new approach. She started to leave the house and went for short walks, even when her mind told her that wasn't possible. Taking baby steps, she started to do more of the things that mattered to her. Perhaps the most helpful change Maria made was facing the fear of insomnia. Instead of trying to fight or avoid insomnia and all the difficult thoughts and feelings associated with it, Maria started to allow it to exist. She would even start to welcome it whenever it chose to show up. And by doing this, Maria found that insomnia started to lose its power and influence. She soon discovered that she didn't need medication to generate sleep that she didn't need to do anything to make sleep happen, and that trying to fight or avoid insomnia and the difficult thoughts and feelings that often come with it only set her up for an ongoing struggle that made everything more difficult. Maria realised that insomnia's survival depends on how we respond to it. And she is 100% sure that with the right approach, no matter how bad your situation might be right now, you can recover. A full transcript of this podcast and an accompanying video can be found at insomniacoach.com forward slash podcast. Okay, Maria, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to come onto the podcast. Yeah, no, absolutely. No, no problem. My pleasure. I'm really excited to have you on. Let's just start right at the beginning. Um, when did your sleep problems begin and what do you think caused those initial issues with sleep? Yeah, so um, if we're talking about the trigger, I think it was a very complex case. There was not like a singular cause or trigger that I could point out. I think I haven't even been able to recognize it yet. Like 100% what was that? I just, I just think it all started at the point when I actually started to have different mental health problems. That was like at the beginning of 2021 when I out of sudden I started to have panic attacks and anxiety attacks when I had never ever, uh, you know, experienced such things before. And, um, Mm -hmm. Um, I think it, I, I was, you know, trying to figure out like why at that time, why, why the beginning of 2021, like I hadn't had any major 
tragic events at that time. So that this is still kind of a mystery to me. Um, but I talked about it with my um, psychotherapist and we've come to the conclusion that it must have been for the reason that I've had a lot of like personal issues that were kind of like, I, I didn't really have a chance to talk about them. So they accumulated over time. And then on top mm -hmm. of that, we had COVID, right? The outbursts of COVID. So we had, uh, I had like experienced loneliness and let's say detachment from, from, you know, social, let's say environment at that time. Um, also like problems with work as well, because I wasn't sure if I'm going to be able to keep, keep my position at work because of COVID. Right. So I think that was a lot of different things that kind of, um, that kind of started all of my problems and insomnia came along with it. So mm -hmm. insomnia came around like beginning of 2021. And, um, yeah, so, so that's, um, that's how I would describe the beginnings, how I would describe a trigger. I know it doesn't really point out any specific trigger, but this is just kind of hard for me to say, to be honest. Yeah. It's, I think everyone's experience is a little bit different. There some people have this really clear and obvious pinpoint. They know exactly when it began, what caused it for other people. It can be a bit mysterious. The, the trigger itself is usually less of an issue. It's more to do with how we're responding to those, that sleep disruption when exactly. it turns up. Yeah. Um, so when, when all this difficulty arrived, what, what was sleep like for you? Was there like, a, a t what was a typical night like if there was such a thing? Um, yeah, so I would have long streaks of not sleeping. Um, and the longest I had was, I think, more than 72 hours when like I didn't sleep for the whole three or four days. And I was mm. absolutely, at this point, I was absolutely anxious and freaked out. I just, I hadn't really <laughs> slept, you know, that was the longest streak of not sleeping for me in my whole life. So I was at that very point, I thought that something must be wrong with me. And I've heard a lot of people on your podcast saying the same. So I also could identify with them because when insomnia, like, let's say comes to your life, you feel as though it's something must be wrong with you. Like how, how can you not sleep? All of the other people are sleeping. How can you just lose your ability to sleep? Right. So I was, I just felt as though, um, something in my brain, like chemistry of my brain has changed permanently. And I was super anxious about that. Um, so how would my sleep look like? Yeah. So I had long streaks of not sleeping and then following that, that I would have maybe, um, microdose of sleep the next night, like two hours and then another streak of not sleeping, like two days. And then maybe again, two hours of sleep. Sometimes I had like five, six hours uh, of sleep um, during this period, but then it would usually f be followed by again, not sleeping or like sleeping in micro doses. So, so that was a nightmare. I remember this so well. I could lay for hours in bed and just focus so much on trying to get asleep that it never happened. Like the more I focus on trying to fall asleep, it never ever happened and then so i would usually like spend hours and hours tossing around tossing over in bed what about your days were you finding the these this difficulty this struggle with sleep was affecting your days as well mm, yeah i mean of course at the, at the beginning when i when this was all new to me right like insomnia thing was just like it, it, it just happened so suddenly and I, I completely, I was so disorientated. I, I didn't know how to deal with it. Like I was, I was just so, you know, just so confused about all the, all of this, mm. especially since I had never before I had never struggled with sleep ever. Like I would fall asleep very easily anywhere. So that was, you know, all the more strange. Um, so about my days, um, I would be all shook up and I could, you know, cry over simple things like a glass would break and I would burst out in tears. I was like, I was even like shouting at my family members for no reason. Like I was, I, I was crying. I was super emotional. Um, physically wise, I was able to function normally. Like 
I could even go work out, to be honest. But the only thing stopping me from that was that my mind wouldn't stop running around the thought if I will be able to sleep that night or not, or how I didn't sleep the last night. It was just my whole day was dominated by the sleep thing because I couldn't stop thinking about it. Like what, you know, regardless of what was going on in my life, even if I, I don't know, maybe I won lottery, I couldn't probably be even enjoying that because I would be still thinking about how I am not able to sleep that night. So that was so, so, let's say, manipulating my whole, let's say, um, the way of thinking. Um, I felt like I couldn't be really enjoying my the activities I used to enjoy as well anymore. And to be honest, um, I think the worst part of it was that I, uh, the loneliness that came along with it, the feeling of being alone and the feeling of, your family members and friends not having an, like a smallest clue about what you're going through because they have never experienced insomnia. And then they, I know they have been trying to like help me and comfort me, but it's just, they, they had no idea about what I was going through. My mom would usually tell me like, okay, don't worry. If you didn't go sleep that night, you would probably go sleep the next night. And I'm like, but you don't get it. I wasn't sleeping for three days. What if I die? And so no one could actually understand me. No one could relate to it because no, none of my friends ever experienced insomnia. None of my family members ever experienced insomnia. So the feeling of loneliness that no one actually understands you, that was also very big part of how I felt during the day, if that makes sense. Yeah, it makes complete sense. And I'm sure it's going to make complete sense to everyone listening to yeah. this as well. Um, see, you mentioned that physically, you felt like, yeah, I could probably still work out or still do activities that I had planned or that are important to me. But at the same time, your mind is like, well, can you still do that? You Do, do you have energy to do it? Are you going to enjoy it? Are you going to be able to focus on it? Um, how did you actually end up responding? Did you still do things that you had planned or did you start to kind of withdraw from those kind of activities because of all this mental chatter that was going on? Yeah, so of course, before I met you and your content, I would definitely withdraw from everything. Um, so I would stop doing what I liked. I would stop even leaving house because I felt like absolute, like just waste. And, um, I, I, I just refrained to do anything. Like I just did the bare minimum all day. And by the way, I couldn't really focus on anything else other than thinking of if I will sleep today. And, you know, at the same time, I remember I started to actually, because I, I was so obsessed about the, the sleep thing. I, I really, and I'm very like, let's say emotional and expressive person. So I would usually say to people very sincerely what is in my mind instead of actually keeping that inside me. So I would, I would, you know, tell all my family and friends about how I feel and about what I'm going through. And then I noticed people, started to withdraw from me as well because I couldn't stop talking about just one thing. And they were like, they, they were fed up with this, which I do understand right now. But at that time, it was also very disappointing for me because I felt like they were just, they didn't want to hang out with me anymore because all I could talk about was sleep and the actually lack of sleep. So I started to lose friends. At this point, um, of course, not family, but um, my family would also be kind of like, I felt as though I shouldn't really talk to them about this anymore because they were also, they didn't express this explicitly, but I felt like they're also kind of fed up and helpless because I could, I would usually talk, call my mom and cry over the phone how I can't see, but she couldn't do anything. And she was just like, I'm sorry, I can't help you. Like, I don't know how to help you. So yeah, that was um that was quite serious at the time before before I actually, you know, met you and your content and was completely lost with this. Did you find that by taking that approach you did actually start to feel better? Or did you feel about the same? Or did it tend to make things more difficult? Like what was your actual experience like? What were the results of kind of withdrawing and doing less? 
Um, okay, so the results of actually withdrawing and doing less, I would just be stuck in the bubble of thinking about sleep. Like I would just spend all my day in, in bed and freak out at the thought of, of actually the moment when I will have to go to bed. And I remember whenever it's be- it, it was becoming to, you know, to get darker outside, I would freak out completely because that means it's a night time. So this is my nightmare time. So this is where I will be suffering for the next, say, seven, eight hours while everybody else will be asleep. So basically all my, all my days would just be like staying in bed, working, like working from bed as well, like just on my laptop because I, yeah, I, I do have this kind of possibility to work remotely. However, yeah, I wouldn't even go for a walk. I wouldn't do anything. It, it almost felt like I was just stuck in a bubble and just not do anything mm-hmm. and just await this nightmare coming, um, you know, in the evening. When you kind of picked up on this idea that we talk about a lot on these podcast episodes of trying to still do some of the stuff that matters what were your thoughts on that were you just kind of thinking no that just sounds impossible or were you thinking i'm going to give it a try like what was your response to that idea and how did you go about changing to kind of start reintroducing stuff act daily activities back into your life Mm -hmm. yeah so i think if i had heard it from like a very random person like my friend like hey go enjoy your activities and still like try to enjoy your life anyway i would think this person has no idea what they're talking about like this is absolutely stupid and i'm not gonna do it they don't know what risk is involved but when i heard it from you i of course i studied your content before and you were like a very reassuring and like convincing person for me also with you know with with the knowledge with a very very you know huge knowledge about the topic and um you know certified as well so i you know you were you were very convincing for me so i thought you know when i heard it from you i i thought okay if he's saying that i need to try it because it did sound a little bit mm, okay i'm not sure if it will work for me but i still wanted to give it a try so that was my my approach when i heard it from you probably might have been different if i heard it from someone super random like i don't know like my Mm. friend or someone who i met on the street and what was that process like for you did you kind of take little baby steps maybe just start by getting outside each day or did you just kind of dive right in and just try to do everything as though insomnia didn't exist i'm curious to hear what your approach was as far as I recall, yeah, I think that was more like baby steps. Um, so I started with like just going out for a walk, going to the shop instead of ordering a delivery. Um, I don't know, just walking a dog out. Um, and then it came to the point when I, after two weeks, I was actually meeting my friends out in the restaurant, which was inconceivable for me at the very beginning because after uh, the night of not sleeping, I was like, that's not possible. I, that's not possible to meet anyone. That's absolutely not happening. And then I actually saw that it is possible. Like you might be a little bit, okay, you won't be your best form. You, you won't be all shiny and, you know, glamorous, but it like friends wouldn't even notice. To be honest, when I showed up without the night of sleep, no one would even notice that I wasn't sleeping. No one even like said anything. I look normal and I kind of behave normal as well. So at this point, I started to realize that, okay, if they didn't notice that, like, I think it's actually worth going out. No one will notice that anyway. So let's just continue doing that. So yeah, that, that's basically how it, how it went. I just started to like, you know, um, I think from the baby steps up until the huge steps. Did you find that it was really hard at first, um, you know, to get yourself outside, going for walks, um, being in social situations again? Or did you find that, you know, straight from day one, for example, as soon as you started to do stuff like that, you noticed that this was kind of an approach that was maybe more helpful compared to doing less stuff? Um, I mean, so, yeah, the very beginnings where it felt awkward but i did have like let's say 
I knew I was doing this for, let's say, to improve my situation. So I, I did really have a lot of hope related to it. So it, it did feel a bit awkward and difficult at, at first, at the very beginning, but it got easier and easier over time. So when I, you know, when I logically, if you, if you see something is working, you, you trust it even more and you go into it deeper, right? So that was how it looked like for me, if that makes sense. Absolutely. And so were you finding that your kind of brain was generating all different kind of stories about this or thoughts that maybe weren't very helpful? Maybe it was telling you things like, oh yeah okay so you went for a walk today that might have felt good today but are you going to be able to do it tomorrow is yeah. this going to work you can't mm -hmm. do this maybe let's stay at home did you find lots of thoughts and stories like that turning up definitely yeah exactly like i'm even surprised you're saying this is as though you're you were reading my mind at the time like it's just <laughs> yeah i would always question myself after like there would be like positive thoughts and two seconds after like this little little demonic thoughts that like okay fine you can do it today what about tomorrow like you, you shouldn't be doing this it's not good for your health mm. so definitely i did have a lot of these thoughts it was super super difficult to overcome them it was a constant battle in my head and it was it was about questioning my actions all the time in my head yeah definitely I think it's, you know, it's interesting that you feel like I just kind of accessed your brain there and <laughs> just pulled out those stories, uh, even though we haven't talked about this before, b before this episode, um, just because they're, you know, that's how the human brain is wired. It just generates thoughts like that, stories like that, ironically, as it's doing its job of trying to look out for us, you know, it's just mm -hmm. trying so hard, it's kind of being a little bit unhelpful and kind of getting in the way. Um, and it can be a little bit like, you know, these maybe two little mini brains, one on each shoulder. One yeah. is kind of reassuring and yes, you can do this. And the other one's like, well, are you sure you can do this? Yes. Maybe you can do it now, but what about tomorrow? And so we're kind of caught in the middle of that, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I think where it can be so helpful, like the process you described of just kind of, even if it is baby steps, just kind of reintroducing stuff you know doing stuff again um, especially things that are important to us meaningful to us is we can prove to ourselves that even when our brain is doing whatever it wants to do helpful thoughts unhelpful thoughts true thoughts false thoughts whatever it's doing whatever it's churning out we can still control the body we can still choose how we respond to those thoughts so even if the brain says you cannot go for a walk today, you're too tired. Physically, we can still kind of stand up, put our shoes mm -hmm. on and go out of the door. And so that's where another reason why I think it's helpful to start getting active again is because we recognize and reinforce this idea that no matter what our brain is telling us, we still get to choose to respond. And every time we respond in a way that's helpful or workable, um, we're reminding ourselves of that. And we maybe we're less likely to get tangled up in trying to battle with our mind because after all, do we need to battle with our mind when we're constantly reminding ourselves that we can respond however we like, regardless of what the mind is doing? Yeah, absolutely. Just kind of rewinding a little bit. Um, you talked about, you know, when the, all this sleep disruption first turned up, one way you tried to deal with it, which is completely understandable, is to kind of do less because you just feel this is just overtaking my life. I don't have the energy to do anything. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't, I don't look right. I'm going to make mistakes, all of that difficult yeah. stuff. What kind of, what other things had you tried in an attempt to kind of improve your sleep, to get things back on track that now you're able to look back, maybe weren't effective or weren't quite so helpful? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So the first thing I can list are were medications. I was a lot of medications that only worsened my state at the very end. Like, um, so I was taking a Zolpidem uh, at some point, even SSRI. Um, then once sleeping pills stopped working because I was very quickly addicted to them, um, 
I, I, I actually, I'm, I'm super like when I just think about it back two years ago, it's just so dreadful to think that I was, when I saw this pack of pills, I was like, I was running to them just to take, like, just to take it. Like I couldn't wait for the moment to, to take these pills. And I, you know, never in my life, I thought I could be addicted to something. And then it turns out I'm so easily addicted to these pills. So I got freaked out and I called my psychiatrist and I told them, Hey, can we get off these pills? Like I feel super, I, I'm just frightened about how it's going to, you know, how it might end up because I'm, I feel like I'm very being super addict, addicted. And by the way, they are not working anymore because my tolerance went up. So I started off with half of the pill and now I need to take two, which is not even an allowed dose, I think for, for, yeah. So my psychiatrist, like they started to prescribe me even weirder things like, um, antipsychotic medication that was used for treatment of schizophrenia, for example. I think it was called quetiapine, something like that. Um, so it was an absolute disaster. Like I felt it's just like, you know, I was, let's say I was going for holidays and then my whole suitcase will be filled up with different types of antipsychotic medication, sleeping pills. I felt as though I just walked out of a psychiatric ward. Like, yeah, it's, it's just, it was absolutely, um, terrible, uh, experience. And it lasted for a couple of months that I was taking the pills. Um, and none of the, like, none of these pills actually work. Like, let's say with the sleeping with pills. Okay. They, they helped me fall asleep initially, of course, but afterwards, um, like it, I would only need, like, I would just need more and more to fall asleep. So if I stopped taking them, that I was in an even worse place that I was before, you know, starting to take them. So that was, that, that was not a result solution, you know, to the problem, not at all. Um, and I, I kind of blame the psych psychiatrist for that as well, because they, they, knew that they shouldn't have been prescribing me this for like a, as a long-term solution. And then even though they knew it perfectly, because, you know, it's, it's an obvious fact, right? It's a short-term solution for insomnia, not a long-term. They kept prescri prescribing me this all the time. Like whenever I ask, no questions, just give, give her the pills and just get off my phone and give her the pills. So, um, yeah, it wasn't working anymore. And not to mention that um, I started to feel super, super depressed uh, the day after. And then I started reading articles about how Zolpidem is linked to creative depression, to creating depression. And there were even cases studied of people that committed suicide and didn't struggle with any mental health issues before taking Zolpidem. So I think it's very important to mention that because, um, like it, it's, it's just, it's never going to do any good. Like pills are never the solution for insomnia. I think, I think like, um, it, it would never do any good long-term short-term. Yes, they are working, but it's just for a limited period of time. And then you would need more. You would get addicted. You would develop other things like depression, maybe as a side effect, which I started to develop. And then I was very scared. Um, because I was also scared that, uh, they might have influenced my brain chemistry long term somehow. Um, so, so yeah, so some medication, psychiatrists, I would usually like call different psychiatrists from like three times a week. Um, it was like a very helpless cry for help. And I never felt as though they would really listen to me. I think. I just felt as though they just kind of like take notes, prescribe something and you would never hear from them again. And the, you know, when I try to outreach to them, uh, like I remember they prescribed me this SSRI. Um, I'm not, not sure what was that exactly. I'm, I can't recall now, but they prescribed me the SSRI and then I took it and um, there was like five milligrams and I felt absolutely like that was how I felt, I can't even describe it. 
I was super scared about how I'm feeling. So I immediately called the doctor and I, I was trying to get in touch with him. Like, Hey, please help me. Like, I feel like, I feel super, I'm scared. Like, I don't know what's going on with my body. I, I feel as though my receptors are not working. Like I couldn't even read an email. I was, I was taking my pen and going with my pen to my fridge. I, it's just, it felt absolutely odd. So I try to call them and they, I mean, they didn't pick up or they said to me, okay, you can schedule an appointment in, in a week. That's my near, you know, I can't give you anything right now. So there was no support from them. There was, there was no like, I just felt as though they would just prescribe me pills and didn't care what happened to me afterwards. So that were, that was, yeah, that were the things that I, I've tried and they only had a detrimental impact on my mental health. I'm curious to know, all the doctors that you spoke to, um, did anyone suggest alternatives to medication or offer you any advice as to how you might be able to deal with this without taking medication or even make some changes while taking medication that might also prove to be helpful? Mm -hmm. Or were you just only offered kind of medication as the only kind of option that was available to you? Yeah, so most of them would actually only uh, prescribe me pills without mentioning any other recourse. Um, some of them were pointing out at the CBDI therapy. Yeah, some of them were like, okay, mm -hmm. here are the pills, but make sure you, you actually sign up for the therapy because this is a long-term solution. Um, so yeah, some of them did, but I feel like most of them were just prescribing pills without mentioning anything else. When you heard about CBTI, cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, mm -hmm. um, was that something that you heard of before? Is it something you explored or looked into? Um, were you able to kind of research anything about that? Mm, not specifically for insomnia. I knew that kind of therapy existed. Um, however, I would more link that to depression, for example, and not really to insomnia. I've never heard of treating insomnia with that before, to be honest. So that was new to me. But at the time, I already actually met you and your content. So I, I already like, you know, I had you. So I didn't really have to have any other like help because, yeah, it was helping to, to have your content to read and listen to you every day. So let's talk a little bit now about what happened kind of next on your journey, the kind of new approach um, that mm -hmm. you explored. Um, what were what were some changes that you made that you're now able to look back on and think that this was really what helped me start moving away from struggling with insomnia and started to create better conditions for sleep, reduce the influence it had over my life. Um, where did that start? You've already mentioned starting to do more, do more things, be more active during the day. Um, what other kind of behavioral changes, new habits or old habits did you bring back um, that you've, that you found to be particularly helpful? So I remember after I've seen your video where you were talking about um, how we are never going to lose the ability to sleep. That was a huge, let's say that was a milestone in my process because for some reason that was so simple, but it sounded so reassuring for me that and convincing that I just like trusted you 100%. And I, from the day I saw that video, I would usually also replay it, you know, uh, in the next days as well. But from this moment, I just thought, um, he's right. Like, I, it, it's true. Like, I shouldn't be like freaking out about this because, yeah. And you also like provided with some kind of evidence or lack of evidence that chronic insomnia can cause any health problems. There was no evidence of that as well. So. I feel like from this point, um, it all started to change. And I, so first of all, I, I stopped, um, I stopped obsessing about if, whether I'm going to go to sleep tonight or not. Um, so that is something that let's say the, the method I have used, I would describe it as facing the fear or facing the pain because, um, usually when the night would, 
like previously before I heard your video about about you know what I just said I would usually freak out when the night was coming the bedtime was coming I would just um you know I run away from the fear and the thing with fear is that when you run away from it it gets bigger and bigger and haunts you like a monster but when you face it it shrinks right so it's I know it it may sound very odd or like to someone who who didn't apply this but I apply this method in my life and I, when it comes to insomnia and panic attacks and it really works like it really works when you face the fear it just shrinks and over time it actually disappears and the same applies to insomnia and I think there's something I I read recently in a book and it said it stuck in my head. It said that pain and fear is not absolute and your experience of fear and pain changes relative to how you react to it. And I think it's perfect to describe the attitude we should have to insomnia. Like that is a great thing to say. I'm not sure if you will agree with me, but this simple method, I think has actually cured me. Like your reaction to insomnia is something that essentially is the most important thing. So um you know it, it's, it's it's all about how you react to this and then once i understood it of course it wasn't like oh i just started applying this method and i was cured the other day no of course not it took time um i had like it took quite a lot of time to apply it 100 percent. but like over time i started to really stop fearing like the lack of sleep stopped fearing the night time uh i even though like i wasn't sure if i'm gonna fall asleep i just i was i would remind myself of the video you posted and i was like okay cool like well i won't die anyway so i mean i won't sleep but that's it i won't die nothing bad will happen i will live like nothing bad will happen and then i was able to like change my thoughts a over this of course the bad thoughts would all, always pop up again they would always try to uh, you know devaluate what i was just saying to me but um it really it takes time of course it's not going to be like overnight change but it really works it really works when you when you actually you know start um maybe stop fearing stop fearing insomnia it will eventually like vanish evaporate it will just, yeah, because it will have no force over you. It, it would just lose its forces. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's just about the behavioral changes. Yeah, I think, I think I just, what I mentioned so far, yeah, I started going out more, of course, doing more activities, but I started to like essentially, um, I really started to not care anymore about sleep. Like I was like, okay, well, right. I might not fall asleep this day, but it will not kill me. Like I will live, I will not die. And there's no proof someone ever died from like lack of sleep. Um, so um, that was the same with my panic attacks. Like they, that was the same treatment that I used and they actually, I was able to overcome them as well. Um, I was like, okay, cool. Like I'll have a panic attack, but there's just a sensation. Nothing is actually physically happening in my body. It's just a sensation of, of your, and your thoughts and what's going on in your head. There's no, nothing, you know, endangering your life at the, at this point. So I think that was super relieving this, this knowledge that the less you care, that, you know, the less powerful insomnia will become. Um, yeah, so I, I would say that that was maybe the most, um, yeah, the, my behavioral approach. Do you remember the title of the book that you just shared that quote from? I'm just what think people might be interested. Oh yeah, of course. So that book wasn't about insomnia, by the way, but I feel like, um, it's kind of connected to the way of, um, how you might treat insomnia and anxiety and panic yeah. attacks. So it's great. So it's called The Tools. And the author is Phil Stutz. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his surname in a correct way, but yeah, it, the book is called The Tools. You can buy it on Amazon. Going back to this idea of 
facing the fear. If someone's listening to this and they think, okay, I think this is something that I want to try. I want to face this fear. I want to face this fear of insomnia. I want to face the fear of what tonight might bring. How do we actually go about facing that fear? Like if you were to give someone kind of a a kind of a list of actions to take that might help them face the fear, what might that look like? Like how do we implement that in practice, do you think? Yeah, I know it's super difficult. Like it's very, very difficult to like describe or maybe implement at the very beginning, but I promise you it's doable. Is doable. So, um, I what I would usually do is just um, okay. Let's try to imagine that what well, like that you won't fall asleep again tonight. Try to imagine that you're laying in bed for four or five hours. Everyone else is asleep, but you're struggling. And the next day is just waiting. In a few hours, you'll need to live through the next day, but you didn't have any sleep. Imagine you're in that situation, and like. Let this thought like be in your body, like flow through your body and just say to yourself, okay, bring it on. I want to experience this. I want to experience the worst that can happen. Bring it on. I'm ready. And you know what? Like I, when I said it to myself, I would feel like I actually get less anxious. And then I felt like a bit power, more powerful. And I would like, Stop thinking about it. I'm, okay, I'm going to continue right now with my day. I'm going to go relax, watch TV. Then if I'm going to go to bed and the, the sleep doesn't happen, well, I'm ready for it. I'm 100% ready for it and I'm not going to be freaked out. And like, I know it sounds super, like, I know it's, it's super difficult for people that are suffering with insomnia because they feel as though they're dying, that they're so desperate. Like, I know where you are. I promise you I've been there. Like, it's absolutely dreadful, but there's hope. Like, it's always, there's always a way out and you can do that. Like, it's absolutely nothing that, you know, you can't die from it. I promise you, there's no way you can die from it. Nothing can happen to you. So... Yeah, it's just, I'm sorry, I don't really have like instruction maybe on how to actually apply this. It's so difficult. Like, I think it's the battle that you need to have with your thoughts. I think really what you described is moving away from the struggle. So moving away from mm-hmm. trying to trying to make sleep happen, trying to remove certain thoughts and feelings from your brain, but taking an an approach where you're acknowledging everything that you're thinking, everything that you're feeling, and you're becoming maybe more of, more of an observer, maybe instead of someone that's trying to fight it, or at the very least, you're kind of removing the dam that you might be trying to build to stop Mm -hmm. all of that stuff arriving. But what happens when we build a dam, it all kind of accumulates behind that brick wall, right? And eventually it all comes overflowing anyway. Um, Mm -hmm. So maybe I think what you've described is just moving away from that struggle, just kind of allowing this difficult stuff to exist. Yeah. Especially if your experience anyway tells you that you can't really get rid of it Um, and just allowing it to flow through you. Yes. As difficult as that might be. I know exactly, but it's, it's actually really working. It, it was the same for my panic attacks. When I first, first heard this method, I was like, mm, okay, I'm not sure if it's going to work, but let's try. It. So, you know, when I had a panic attack and when I, and I will, I, when I would like try to calm down, it will only get worse, only get worse, always. And then once I remember, and that, that was like when I was, I was uh, in, in, on the airplane and there was a very long flight, like 11 hours, 12 hours. And I, I had a huge panic attack on the plane. Um, that was so like, that was so frightening to the point that I was actually about to exit the plane. Like at the boarding, I was about to actually tell the flight attendant, sorry, I, I think I'm not going because I can't. I, I just, um, I don't know. I'll have a panic attack. But I thought to my, like, I said to myself, okay, you're going to get through this. It happened to you a lot of times. It's not going to kill you. It never killed you. And then the panic attack, of course, came. Um, and then I just, 
instead of like trying to calm down as I would usually do, like, oh my God, I need to calm down. Everybody will notice. Oh my God, nobody can notice that. I just felt as though this is normal. You're just having a panic attack. Just let it feel it, like bring it on. I want to feel it even more. Just try to like feel it with all of your body. Let it, let this feeling flow for you. And it will actually calm down after a while, like after a three, two minutes. And the same was with my insomnia. Like when I, you know, when let's say um, that was bedtime and I was like, I don't know, uh, midnight, then 2 a.m., 3 a.m., I'm still not sleeping. And I, I was like, you know, normally, I think at the very beginning, I would freak out. I would be watching my clock all the time and, you know, just, just getting crazy. Whereas after applying this method of like, Mm, you know, not avoiding the fear and just facing it. I was like rather, you know, laying in bed and thinking, well, that's okay. Uh, eventually I'm probably going to fall asleep, even if it's microdose. And then I'm just going to watch a movie right now. Like there's nothing bad happening. I'm just going to like watch a movie and, um, let, let the bad feeling flow through my body. Like I'm not sleeping. Well, okay. What can I do about this? Nothing. So, yeah, so this is how I try to explain this to myself. And you need to remember, like, the bad thoughts will always pop up. Even, like, sometimes they will try to devaluate what you are thinking and they will try to, like, push you away from your path. But those are just thoughts. Those are just thoughts. They will always pop up. It's just thoughts. So, yeah, I think that would be my advice. There's just so much great stuff there. I'm, <laughs> cu I'm curious to hear, you know, like, like you said, I think you already mentioned this, but even taking this approach, you know, of like kind of facing the fear, allowing the difficult thoughts and feelings to show up, allowing the possibility of insomnia to show up. Um, it's not kind of like, oh, I'm going to do this. And then all of a sudden, all these difficult thoughts permanently disappear and all of a sudden you're having great nights of sleep again, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I'm curious to know what the kind of process or like the kind of timeline was was like for you. Was this something that you found that you had to practice for days, weeks or even months um, in order to notice that it was helping? Like, I'm just curious to hear what, what kind of timeline um, from your own experience. To be honest, that was when I started using this method, this behavioral change, that was kind of quick. That was like a few days and I was back on track with my sleeping. I was like, wow, I slept seven hours. Like, wow, it really worked. But then once that bad night, like, you know, when I had a bad night, let's say after a few days, it would, I, I would have a rebound of anxiety, like, uh, you see, it's actually not working. So my bad thoughts would tell me like, ah, uh -huh, you are so confident. You're never out of this. You'll be stuck with insomnia for the rest of your life and there's no cure for you. So that, that would be like, I would have a rebound sometimes, but then I would again, like apply the method of like what, what we were talking about just, just now. And then it would again improve for a few days that would, I would have a rebound as well. And then I would apply this and was, that would improve as well. Um, so I would say that took me like to, to like fully recover, let's say from insomnia. Is, is that what you're asking for or just right after applying the method? Yeah, I would say like maybe where you kind of got to a point where you felt I'm kind of in, I'm kind of free of it. You know, I'm kind of independent. I can live my life independently of how I sleep. Um, I'm not so much tangled up in the struggle. It's not something that has a big influence over my life anymore. I feel like that would be, hmm, maybe a month or so. Yeah. When I got this confidence about like, okay. I'm actually able to recover from insomnia, but at this point I was like sure that it would at, at some point come back. But then I had the tools to defend myself and to like approach it in a right way. So yeah, I think the, the 
the very, very big lesson for me was something that you've been talking about a lot in your podcast and in your like content on YouTube that the most important thing is actually your approach to, to the sleep and your approach to insomnia and uh, how you react to it will, will essentially, um, influence, um, you know, how it will develop. So that, that was something that was a super big lesson for me, like the, the attitude. Um, because yeah, well, when I started having insomnia, like when it happened in my life, my attitude was like fighting, um, anxious fighting. Like I was super confused. I was freaked out. I was battling the thoughts all the time. I was trying to like, you know, fight the, the fact that I'm not sleeping, uh, like forcing myself to fall asleep, which is like, it's impossible to do it. Like, okay, with pills, it's, it's, it's possible, but there's no way you can force yourself to sleep. Um, so, you know, my, my initial approach to that, my reaction to insomnia was completely like fighting with that. And then when I changed it to accepting it and just acknowledging it, it just like, it was shrinking, um, more and more and it eventually it disappeared. Yeah, I like that way you said it just kind of felt like it was shrinking and shrinking. Um, because one of my, one of my favorite analogies about the insomnia struggle is we have this big scary thing called insomnia and we want to fix it. We want to get rid of it. So we kind of want to study it to figure it out, right? So we can get rid of it. So we might pick up a magnifying glass and we've got the insomnia here and we're just staring at the insomnia through this magnifying glass. And of course, when we look through a magnifying glass, that thing is really big. And when we're focused just on looking through the magnifying glass, we don't see anything else around us, right? All we see is that thing that we're staring at. Um, and I think when we start to move away from the struggle, it's kind of like instead of kind of prodding and poking at this thing under under the magnifying glass, what we're actually doing is putting the magnifying glass down. So the insomnia might still be there, but now, because we put the magnifying glass down, our field of view is so much bigger, right? We can yes. now kind of see the world around us. Um, we might be better able to engage in the world around us, and we just free up our attention to do more of the things that matter, rather than everything being consumed by what we see through that magnifying glass. And yeah. I just think that kind of aligned with what you were saying, where it kind of shrunk. That's just what kind of yeah. reminded me of that. And, you know, when something, when we're able to recognize that, okay, this thing is here, maybe I can't directly get rid of it, but what I can do is kind of dilute it by adding other things to my life, doing good stuff, it starts to lose its influence, right? So it feels like it gets smaller. Yeah. And when something even when it's present, if something loses its influence over us, maybe then it becomes less of a problem that we feel we need to address. And when it comes to sleep and all the difficult thoughts and feelings that can come with it, the less engaged we are with trying to control that stuff, the more it's able to kind of take care of itself and get back on track by itself. Definitely. Like, it, it, I just... I felt it's so true because I, I felt like, um, I just, um, you know, disempowered insomnia, by the way, of just taking away the importance of it. Uh, so, um, yeah, I just ignored it. Like at some point I just started to ignore it, like the screaming of insomnia, I just ignored it. And I felt like it just devaluated the whole thing. And then, it becomes smaller and smaller and smaller and eventually actually disappeared. One thing you touched upon was that you're kind of not, not using sleeping pills anymore. Um, I'm curious to hear like what your, what your kind of process was to, to moving away from them because sometimes it feels like they're the only thing that we have available to us, um, that maybe we need them. Otherwise no sleep is going to happen or we need to always have them as an option just in case. Um, what was that process like for you in terms of, just moving away from them and just not even having them available anymore. So I feel like, yeah, it lasted very long until I actually was able to stop taking them. That lasted for months, like maybe half a year, I would say. 
Uh, so I was, I already, by that time, I already developed addiction to the sleeping pills. And then the moment I actually, I threw them all away, like, I, I think, I remember even like flashing them off in the toilet because what happened is that I really started to, you know, I, I'm very sensitive person, like in terms of emotional intelligence. So I can very easily recognize when something like what I'm feeling is being um, influenced by like external, let's say object, or is it my own feeling? And then after taking those pills, the next day, I would feel as though I had a like, a, um, as though I was like on drugs, I was depressed, like I was the, the feeling of depression, like I, you know, I can't recognize, like I, I used to have my sad moments, of course, everybody has them, some maybe depressive thoughts a little bit, but those thoughts were different. This was like feeling as though I really, I start to have depression. It was like, everything was so vain. I, I felt like I, I would like to start crying and I just, I felt it was like so strange for me. Like I never felt that way before. So I immediately linked this to the sleeping pills because I knew this wasn't mine. Like I never had this feeling before. So I think that at this point I, I was so scared. Like I was super scared about my mental health at this point. And I said to myself, okay, this is the point where I need to say goodbye to the sleeping pills. How, like, however difficult this is going to be, I need to, I, I can't do this anymore because it's just, it started to have super detrimental impact on my mind. And I, I couldn't allow it anymore. I just felt like, no, it, it can't happen. I can't deal with depression on top of that. I can't, it can't happen. So, mm, so yeah, that was my trigger. Let's say the point where I decided goodbye, sleeping pills. I can't. Maria, I'm really grateful for you coming on and, you know, giving up your time to share your experience. I just know that a lot of people are going to find your experience really helpful. Um, hopefully as well, hopeful. Um, and, you know, just giving people the possibility and the reassurance that it is that we can kind of get out of this struggle, um, no matter how difficult things feel. Um, but I do have one last question for you, which is one that I ask everyone that comes on. Um, and it's this, if someone with chronic insomnia is listening and they feel as though, you know, they've tried everything, that they're beyond help, that they'll never be able to stop struggling with insomnia, what would you say to them? I came from the point where I was like, I overdosed, like once I even almost overdosed on sleeping pills and I drank alcohol as well because um, that was when I was on holidays and then I I was, I think I was just so hopeless and so desperate and so just all the, you know, all the things you can imagine how I felt. Um, it wasn't just for clarity. It wasn't like it was a suicidal thing. Like I didn't want to do it. It's just that I would do anything to fall asleep so I just had a bunch of pills um, and I took them like all, I think I took like five or six pills at once and I drank a bottle of wine before just with anything to get fall asleep. I just wanted to fall asleep. And then I'm lucky, I'm very lucky and grateful that I'm still here today. But you see at what point of, you know, at what point in my life I came from, right? Like what point I was in that was absolutely a nightmare and I al almost killed myself. And then where I am now, right? Um, I don't have insomnia anymore. I can sleep without any pills, without nothing. So it, it's just as a matter, like, you know, just wanted to say it as a, let's say a word of hope for anybody that could be listening to that because it doesn't matter what state you are in right now. Maybe you're taking a lot of pills daily as well you are able to get out of it. Like there's always hope. You can always do it. And um, there's definitely, you're gonna, you're gonna recover from, from insomnia. Remember that you are not alone and there's like millions of people experiencing the same thing, even though you don't see them around you, but they are there. Like there's a lot of people suffering from the same thing you are suffering right now. And as difficult as it might seem right now, I promise you, you will recover. And 
you need to change your approach to insomnia and try to like, let's say, take out the import, like get, you know, to try to disempower the insomnia. I don't know. I know how it, how confusing it sounds, but I promise you will be fine and there's a way out and you will 100% recover. Um, it's, it's just, I'm, I'm 100% sure about that because I was at the same point as you and maybe at even worse. So yeah, there's, there's hope. All right. Well, that's great. Um, thanks again, Maria, for coming on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no worries. Thank you so much, Martin, as well.